God bless us and the Virgin protect us. Once again, I want to explicitly acknowledge my debt and gratitude to Our Lady Fatima. She has to get the credit for anything good to her beautiful in each one of these conferences, and I'll take the credit for the blame, or the blame rather, for the faults. And again, through the conferences, all the quotes, uh, well, not all, but the quotes in general are edited, cut and pasted for the sake of time and clarity. Ave Maria Prisima, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Yesterday we heard the story of Louis Gina Sinapi, the venerable Louis Gina Sinapi, Bruno Cornicchiola, and the Virgin of Revelation. We saw that on April 12, 1937, Our Lady appeared to Louis Gina at a small cave near Tre Fontane in south of Rome, and had told Louis Gina that she would return to that place and convert and make use of an enemy of the church, a man who wanted to kill the Pope. She also told Louis Gina to go to the St. Peter's Square and find a woman dressed in black and ask her to bring her to her brother, who was a cardinal. And then she was to deliver that message to the cardinal and also inform him that he would soon be Pope. We saw that all that came to pass, that the cardinal was Eugenio Pacelli, who some two years later became Pope Pius XII. We also saw that exactly 10 years to that very day later, April 12, 1947, and at that very site, Our Lady appeared to Bruno Cornocchiola, a blaspheming, wife-beating thug who had taken an oath to kill the Pope, and then he was instantly converted. We saw that she gave Bruno a message to deliver to the Pope. We saw that Pius XII wept when Bruno read him the message and that the Pope told Bruno that on that same day, April 12th, he himself had received confirmation directly from Our Lady of her appearance in Rome. We saw that after his conversion, Bruno was adamant about defending the absolute importance of living in and according to the true faith. And he would often ask, if even the Protestants are saved, why did the Virgin come to me and tell me to go back to the Holy Sheepfold when she could have very well left me where I was among the Adventists? We saw that permission for pilgrimages and devotion to the Virgin of Revelation was given with unusual speed by the Vicariate of Rome. We saw that Pius XII blessed a statue of Our Lady, the Virgin of Revelation, in St. Peter's Square on October 5th, less than six months after her appearance to Bruno's children. We saw that the Vicariate of Rome has a public chapel at the shrine, staffed by conventional Franciscans, where the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is publicly offered at the shrine of Our Lady with the statue of the Virgin of Revelation as she appeared to Bruno. We saw that the dirt from what was once a place of sin and immorality has become a source of grace. And we heard what is probably the first translation to English of major parts of the message given by the Virgin of Revelation on that April 12th. We saw that Our Lady said it is love that wins everything, divine love, love of virtue. We saw that Our Lady said, do not forget the rosary, which cooperates much with your sanctification, and that the Hail Marys are so many golden arrows that reach the heart of Jesus. We saw that Our Lady said, before Russia converts and leaves the way of atheism, a tremendous and severe persecution will arise. We saw that Our Lady said there will be days of sorrow and mourning from the east a strong people, but far away from God, will unleash a tremendous attack and will break the most holy and sacred things when it will be allowed them to do so. We saw that Our Lady said the world will end another war more ruthless than the previous ones. We saw that Our Lady said that priests will be trampled and slaughtered, the broken cross and the crumpled cassock that she'd appeared with at her feet signified the stripping of the exterior signs of the priesthood, and they were going to be signs of the time that charity had grown cold. We saw that Our Lady said Satan is loosed for a period of time for the sanctification of the saints. We saw that Our Lady said that anger will be unleashed over all the earth. Satanic freedom, which will be allowed, will bring massacres everywhere. You will see men driven by Satan make a united league to fight every form of religion. The most stricken will be the Church of Christ to cleanse it of the filth that's in it. We saw that Our Lady said the entire church will undergo a terrible test to clean up the carnage that is infiltrated among its ministers, especially among the orders of poverty, moral testing and spiritual testing, and that for the time indicated in the heavenly books, the forces of evil endanger priests and the faithful by assaulting them with whatever means they can, especially false ideologies and theologies. We saw that Our Lady commanded us to preserve the weapon of victory faith, to love one another, Love one another so much, annulling in yourself the depths of haughtiness and pride, have humility in the hearts. Love each other and greet each other with greetings of love and unity. God bless us and the Virgin protect us.
We saw Our Lady said, the word of the one who made everything is true. Prepare your hearts, draw closer with more fervor to the living sacrament among you, the Eucharist, which one day will be desecrated and no longer believed to be the real presence of my son. We sought Our Lady said that unite ourselves, to, to unite ourselves in the love of God and make one rule, the living gospel, that the sheepfold of Christ is and will be the salvation of all who want to be saved. We saw that Our Lady said that shepherds of the flock who do not do their goody, duty give scandal to the flock and divert it from the way, the truth, and the life because too much of the world is coming to their souls. And that priests will show they are truly their children by living in purity, far from the world, by being more righteous, far in the way of Calvary. We saw that Our Lady said that the destructive anger of divine justice would soon descend upon the earth, but there was still time for sinners to repent and place their entire lives under her mantle in order to be saved. We saw that Our Lady said humanity is lost because it no longer has ones who lead it sincerely in justice. We saw that Our Lady said that time is now passing to the end of all things in the world. We saw that nine years after her death, the Venerable Lugina appeared to Bruno and told him he had to offer himself as a victim for the conversion and sanctification of priests and religious who have abandoned the path of doctrine and morality and by whose fault many souls go to hell. And finally, we saw that the first message on April 12, 1947 was only the first of 60 messages, dreams and prophecies, that Bruno received periodically up to a few months before his death. And through it all, he always pointed out these messages were to be believed by pure human faith and, to be, and that he subjected himself to every judgment of Holy Mother Church. Today, we'll take a closer look at a few of those messages and a few of the miracles. But before we do that, we'll briefly consider the remarks made on December 8, 2015 by Cardinal Jose Martins, the Prefect Emeritus of the Congregation of the Cause of Saints. In regard to the significance of these messages, he wrote, I personally consider the publication of these messages to be of great spiritual benefit. The many unpublished messages, the warnings of the Virgin over the course of half a century, have an undeniable catechetical and prophetic value. The Virgin predicted the crisis that would erupt in the clergy. The cassock thrown on the ground and the broken cross at her feet are an image that in 1947 could not be well understood but one that in the following decades has been presented in all its drama. And she warned of many other risks and dangers threatening the church and the world today, as well as in the near future. So in, in order to get as much context as possible before we draw all this together, or start on together, we'll start by considering three other messages. The first two, two were delivered to Pius XII, the third to St. John the Twenty-third. But before I read these, I want to pose a question for each one of the good sisters to ask herself, why did I enter Carmel? Was it not to follow Our Lady's call to sanctify myself, especially by praying and sacrificing for everyone, but in a particular way for priests? The Virgin of Revelation February 21st, 1948. I say this to my priest's sons. Jesus is cold because he is forgotten and abandoned by you in his hidden love. Prayers and visits warm him so much, but now everyone is cold and Jesus is cold. Warm him. Mother asks that of you. Love him and do not desecrate him, but make him loved by all. Give an example of how to love him. He is forgotten. And the virgin started crying. Jesus, the sweet and humble of heart, my dear sons, my beloveds, he is the font of pure water, yet he is thirsty. You're becoming worldly, divesting yourselves of the sacred to guess, desecrate, and abandon the priesthood given to you by my son. The world thirsts for truth. But you no longer give it the water to quench its thirst. Many of you give bad example. You forget the mandate of Christ. Go and preach to every creature. From your fruits, they will recognize that you are mine. Sons, make Jesus known. The gospel you've completely forgotten. Turn to the living water, the source of life. Bring souls to Christ. The thirst of Jesus must be your thirst. Souls. Give him souls to drink, only souls. 
Only thus will you give proof to the world that you're truly worthy of the mandate of my son, my creature. Give him to drink. My creatures, give him to drink. Woe to you if you do not execute this mandate. You're the shepherds. Guide the flock to the holy fold, the church. She stops weeping. Jesus searches for the food of your life. Jesus is hungry, hungry for your love. His food is your works, your faith, your charity. Save and sanctify souls. Work according to the will of Christ the priest. You must dedicate yourselves completely to worship at the altar and to the guidance of souls for the glory of the Father with the efficacious help of the Holy Spirit. My children, many will come in my name. They will do deceptive wonders. Have faith in what my son Jesus told you in the beginning, that he would always be among you and with you until he drinks from the chalice again. Therefore, you will be persecuted, and in persecuting you, they will persecute my son. They will try to convince you to live as the world lives. Do not listen. Practice and live true love of neighbor without class distinction. All have a soul to be saved. Treat all equally as one family. Let them always know the loving heart of Jesus. The sacrament of the altar, the prisoner of love, forgotten by many, is all there is to give. I have given them to you. You give them to others with respect and true love. Call me and have me called mother. I am mother of the pure clergy, mother of the holy clergy, mother of the faithful clergy, mother of the united clergy, mother of the living clergy. Do not forget that the world watches you and desires and expects from you the example of a holy life lived heroically. Again, she's crying. Distance yourself from the world. Give example that you are of Christ. Give proof of your love by forgiving each other and stay far from discord and hate. It is a mother who asks this of you. Love one another. I say this to my priest's sons. Jesus is forgotten and abandoned by you in his hidden love. Make him loved by all. Give an example of how to love him. He is forgotten. You're becoming worldly, divesting yourself of the sacred to desecrate and abandon the priesthood given to you by my son. The world thirsts for truth, but you no longer give it the water to quench its thirst. Many of you give bad example. The gospel you've completely forgotten Bring souls to Christ. Woe to you if you do not execute this mandate. You're the shepherds. Guide the flock to the holy fold of the church. You must dedicate yourselves completely to worship at the altar and to the guidance of souls. Be careful not to divert souls from true worship. My children, many will come in my name and do deceptive wonders. You'll be persecuted, and in persecuting you, they will persecute my son. I'm the mother of the pure clergy the mother of the holy clergy, the mother of the faithful clergy, the mother of the united clergy, the mother of the living clergy. But where are they? Where are they? There's almost no faith, almost no charity. Where's the faith? If a priest actually believes the Bible, is inspired, inerrant word of God. In other words, that God doesn't lie. That our understanding of Scripture has to be in accordance with that of the Father's. In other words, tradition doesn't lie. And he's going to be mocked and ridiculed and laughed at by most priests. I don't need the fingers on two hands to count the priests that I personally know that believe the Bible is true. And I don't say that with any happiness. Without faith, there can't be charity. If you're not praying and sacrificing yourself to priests, who will? Who will? It's almost no faith, almost no charity. We're talking about priests. We're talking about priests. If you're not praying for them, sacrificing yourself for them, then who will? August 15th, 1949. Little children, listen to the call that my maternal heart addresses to you. 
Why do you not turn away from sin? If you persevere in it, this will lead you to the most grievous of losses. The people walk in the wickedness of sin because they lack knowledge of the plans of God, which are full of love. The Lord will seek all hearts, is to teach them the true path of peace. And he will make his truths known to the ignorant and despised, and through them he will tell his plans and his thoughts to those who use science as an excuse to deny me, to the rich of the world, to the arrogant. He who loves good and suffers for it, he who knows the truth, is persecuted for it, is truly born in Christ to live of his life and to go to God the Father. God the Father loves justice because it's right. Listen to that voice that is the voice of justice, true justice, sanctifying, reparative justice. Awaken a justice and escape the world that perishes in its worthless mud. Go to Jesus, children. It is a mother who tells you with the bitterest pain in her heart, who is embittered for your hearts hardened to sin. Go to him. Repent of the evil that you continually do, trampling on the good and the true. God wants you to repent of your sins. From his earthly home in the Eucharist, Jesus waits for your hearts to change them from stone into flesh. My little children love him. He lives in love. He awaits yours. He, my son, is your only salvation. Children, go to him. Live in him and be with him. Do it for me. I'm your mother who loves you so much. Even me, present at Golgotha, at the redemption with my love, I bore it with Jesus, for Jesus, and in Jesus. He calls you and wants to save you. Go. Do not wait for him to say to you, depart from me. Why do you not turn away from sin? It will lead you if you persevere in it to the most grievous of losses. The people walk in the wickedness of sins because they lack knowledge of the plans of God. God the Father loves justice because it's right. Listen to that voice that is the voice of justice, true justice, sanctifying, reparative justice. Awake to justice and escape the world that perishes in its worthless mud. Go to eat Jesus, repent of the evil that you continually do. He is your only salvation. Go to him, live in him, and be with him. He calls and wants to save you. Go, do not wait for him to say to you, depart from me. August 15, 1958. Many apostolic souls are required, courageous in truth and love, full of a living and working faith, lovers of true love, and these will have to make known the times. There will be a tremendous earthquake that will shake the entire globe. I am giving you a maternal warning. Neither go about nor go to sleep if you are in mortal sin, but confess and repent of what you have done and do not do it anymore. Do not sin, my children, do not sin. For in an instant, sinners will be called the judgment, and the judgment of God is infallible. Yes, my children, the sun will darken and the stars will fall, but not, do not hear only the material meaning. There is a part to be interpreted spiritually, and it will be the sons of the proud and the stars of the arrogant that will fall, as Satan has already fallen. Pray, pray much, and do penance with every means at your disposal. Do penance on every occasion that is presented to you. It is a request to my son, and the request to my son Jesus is easy because it is a quest of love. The penance he asks you is to love your neighbor and give a good example through your life. With my son and God the Father, do not hate anymore. Always forgive. Do not take vengeance. Jesus is a judge. Say this ejaculation. Jesus, son of the Virgin Mary, have compassion and pity on us. Save many souls. Outside of the true and the holy, the Roman, Catholic, and Apostolic Church, there is no true peace. There is no true love, and there is no real salvation. The priest is your true salvation. He's your true sanctification, but only in a way, and it is this. Listen to him and practice the teachings of the truth that comes from his mouth. It will be my son who speaks to you through the priest. Outside of the Father's house, where it is the, the Pope, the holiness of the Father, there is darkness and confusion. Write in every place that you believe opportune these words, but first of all, write them in your heart. With Jesus, the Son of the Virgin Mary, I crucify my flesh for eternal life. Sing in joy, read the truth, in sorrow recite the Psalms. Pray in joy and in sorrow, pray always. Prayer is the breath of the Spirit. Be loving and thoughtful of all, practice the works of mercy. Loving everyone does not mean holding an attitude of a satanic false misery or sentimentality. To love everyone means remaining in peace with everyone and doing for, for all that which you would want everyone, even your enemies, to do unto you. 
You will have to suffer greatly through the fault of the imprudent. Remain firm in faith because that is the precise point that Satan tries to make you fall. Love and forgive, forgive and love. There's a mother who asks this of you. I'm the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus, and your mother of love. Go forward in conquest. The victory is and will be yours if you live according to the dictates of the Holy Spirit. The resolute assurance of salvation is to walk in the word of God, to return to the pure source of the gospel, to listen to the word of salvation from the apostolic sea, the church that radiates to all the world, and do not listen to the falsehoods of the world. Do not remove the priestly habit. The habit is a reminder. It is a heavenly sign. There'll be a tremendous earthquake that will shake the entire globe. Do not sin. For in an instant, sinners will be called to judgment, and the judgment of God is infallible. The sun will darken, the stars will fall. But do not hear only the material meaning. Spiritually, it will be the sons of the proud and the stars of the arrogant that will fall. Pray, pray much, and do penance on every occasion that is presented to you is a request of my son Jesus. The penance he asks you is to love your neighbor and give a good example to your life. Be loving and thoughtful with all. Practice the works of mercy. Love and forgive. Forgive and love. It is a mother who asks this of you. Walk in the word of God. Return to the pure source of the gospel. Listen to the word of salvation from the apostolic seed that radiates to all the world. Do not listen to the falsehoods of the world. Do not remove the priestly habit. The habit is a reminder. It is a heavenly sign. Since, as Cardinal Martins pointed out, the warnings of the Virgin regarding the crisis in the clergy and other risks and danger that threaten the church and the world today and the near future have an undeniable and catechetical prophetic value, we're going to spend some time taking a closer look. There's a remarkable consistency in the 60 visions, messages, and prophet, prophetic dreams over the course of some 50 years. Besides translation, the real challenge was just selecting the passages. Organizing them wasn't too challenging, since the broken cloths and the crumpled cassock lying at Our Lady's feet already provide a very clear context for her message. They're a symbolic representation, a visual key for understanding her messages and placing them into context. And beyond that, she actually explained their precise significance when she told Bruno, quote, here's the broken cross near the cassock, which signifies the stripping of the exterior signs of the priesthood. When these things come to pass, this will be the sign that is the time that charity will become cold. So the stripping of the exterior signs of the priesthood is the sign that charity has grown cold. And of course, that gives us a very, very clear context for the Virgin's message. Since Our Lady is citing a line spoken by her son in the 24th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, verse 12, and I quote, And because iniquity has abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. Close quote, the inspired, inerrant word of God. Because iniquity has abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. In Greek, the actual word used here for iniquity is anomia, which literally means lawlessness, an utter discard for God's law. As one commentary put it, anomia refers to general immorality and licentiousness, to impatience regarding rules and discipline, and to connivance at and imitation of heathen practices. Okay, because of lawlessness, because of an utter regard for God's law, the charity of many shall grow cold. And this, according to Our Lady, the stripping of the exterior signs of the priesthood will be the sign of that time. In other words, when we see the stripping off the exterior signs of the priesthood, we know that we're in that time. And exactly what time that is, is also clear from the scriptural context. As we said, this scripture is taken from chapter 24 of St. Matthew's Gospel. It's often referred to as the Olivet Discourse, simply because our Lord spoke those things as he stood on Mount Olivet. He's looking down on Jerusalem and the temple. It's also sometimes called the Little Apocalypse, because our Lord is speaking about the end of the world. Now, the Virgin of Revelation already stated that the time is now passing the end of the things of the world. But she also gave an exterior sign that would be visible to everyone that has eyes to see, they would be able to understand the significance of what they were seeing. And this was in 1947, a time when, as Cardinal Martin pointed out, the cassock thorn on the ground and the broken cross at her feet were an image that could not be well understood, but now, unfortunately, are all too clear to each one of us. So following Our Lady, we'll, you, we'll use selections from the Olivet Discourse as a framework for putting her comments into context. For the most part, I'll refrain from comments since they're self-explanatory. And you shall hear war of wars and rumors of war. April 12, 1947, the Virgin. The world will enter in another war more ruthless than the previous ones. 
November 10th, 1973, Bruno. The Israelis and Arabs are coming to an agreement, but it will always be a forced agreement. There will always be a powder keg with fire nearby. One day it will ignite and blow up everything and ruin the whole world with all living things. March 12th, 1983, a message delivered to the Vatican. The Virgin, love one another. It is a time of true love to avoid a more powerful and destructive war than the last two world wars. The danger is at the door, a nuclear war. Men reckless and proud and satanic arrogance want the world in their hands, not thinking of the kingdom of heaven. They do not prepare for peace, and so they rashly prepare themselves for destruction. The atom bomb is ready, men without conscience threaten to use it, and the danger is becoming closer than you think. For years, I have tried in all ways to warn you, and you have not listened to me. But my son, by an act of mercy, still allows you, through my intervention, a period of time for you to reflect on your conscience. Radioactive rain pollutes everything from plants to water and from animals to man. It can be avoided, as I have already said on April 12, 1947, and elsewhere in years long past. Call it apocalypse, but it will occur if you do not convert. There will be no bomb shelters that will save you. Take refuge in the church, the church created by my son for the salvation of men, and do true penance, staying away from the vices of the flesh, depart from the world of evil, and sanctify yourselves with holy things. Pray, my children, pray in faith, and you will be saved from the satanic hell that has arrived in your midst. It is a mother who loves you and who asks this of you. Listen to me. June 3, 1986. Bruno, it's a dream, but what I saw made me tremble. The world involved in atomic warfare and people fell dead, plants dried up, and animals as well as men. December 3rd, 31st, 1990, the version of Revelation. Everyone is talking about war and peace. The war will extend to the world if you do not convert. And there should be pestilences and famines and earthquakes in places. August 15th, 1958, the Virgin. There will be a tremendous earthquake that will shake the entire globe. August 4th, 1999. With the Holy Virgin, I find myself on a high mountain. She says, look. I look and I see a multitude of busy people like ants coming and going. Someone falls to the ground, I see they lash out and strike each other, and I also hear their agitated voices, angry, blaspheming, and accusing each other of the evil in the world. Some are at war with weapons in their hands. I see blood and the dead everywhere. Suddenly I hear the earth shake under my feet. I sweat, I get scared. The Virgin tells me, do not be afraid. It's an earthquake, a sign, a call for the world to convert. I ask, these are signs of a call to conversion? Are there any signs? of them recalling the doctrine the spirit of truth that they have fought. The Virgin answers, they are deaf and foolish. They see signs that are a reminder, but they do not reflect on this reality. The Virgin shows me religious men and women, priests, bishops, cardinals, and tells me, see these fools deny the true God and have probably made themselves gods. The corruption and spiritual evil you see is being done to satisfy their God and their material good. They are evil and fail to do good. Evil has entered into them. They utter their minds and walk on a wrong path. They have no faith and do not believe. As the Virgin speaks, I hear the loud shrieks of bloodthirsty people full of wrath, and I see the blood flowing like waters in the stream. Take heed that no man seduce you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and they will seduce many. Virgin of Revelation, my children, many will come in my name. They will do deceptive wonders. There are so many false apparitions. For my money, the worst one, the very worst one in our day and age, the one that's caught so many just droves of people in diabolical snares, is Magigori. Now set aside the fact that the ordinary on two different times twice has condemned the thing, it's obviously false. Any spirit that appears on demand is not from heaven. That's just a principle. Any spirit that appears on demand is not from heaven. If a spirit appears on demand, and that's exactly what happens with these so-called visionaries, then you're at a seance. You're at a seance. Anyone with eyes to see can easily contemplate. I'll just throw one incident out there, which makes everything perfectly obvious. It's filmed. You can readily see this on the internet. On January 14th, 1985, that's 32 years ago. On January 14th, 1985, during one of the so-called apparitions, while well, Vicka, one of the fake visionaries, was supposedly in ecstasy, a Frenchman poked at her eyes. And she dirked back. It's all on film. Now it gets worse. Immediately after this fakery, Vicka claimed that the reason she pulled back 
is because Our Lady had appeared with the child Jesus, and coincidentally, just when the Frenchman poked at her eyes, it looked as if the child Jesus was going to slip from Our Lady's hand. This is on film. She's taught, saying this. Are we supposed to believe that Our Lady would come down from heaven and slip and drop the little baby Jesus just when some guy pokes at her eyes, just like the Three Stooges? Now, if you saw someone dropping a baby, if anyone saw somebody dropping a baby, would you jump backwards or would you jump forwards to try to catch the baby? Can any more reasonable man believe this thing? It's just blasphemous. People are seduced by these lies. They're seduced because they want to be seduced. And there's droves of them. And you can't convert them. In more than 20 years of going after this, I've had one person take these warnings seriously. This is a powerful spirit. It's not of God. And the priests are silent. We continue. August 14th, 1999. The virgin to priests. My priest sons believe that there's only one life, one doctrine, one salvation. Believe in Christ, my son, who chose 12 apostles, choosing one of them as the rock Peter, on whom he founded his church, which gives life by means of you. If you do not believe, and through your own fault others do not believe, you will go for all eternity to that hell that exists and is real. God, my dear children, not only gave you the true faith, but with it the church, the only way of salvation. It is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic under Peter the Roman Pontiff. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall put you to death. January 1st, 1985. Bruno, I am transported to the center of Rome, to the Piazza Venezia. A huge crowd is crying, revenge, revenge, terrible revenge. Many dead were in the square and on the streets. I also saw blood all over the world, the entire world smeared with blood. Suddenly the crowd shouted, everyone to St. Peter's, everyone to St. Peter's. So I too in the crowd was pushed to St. Peter's, while everyone in a chant of hatred and anger continued to sound, re shout revenge. At the same time, Bruno heard another word scream fiercely, Bezboznik, which in Russian, as he later discovered, means without God. The Pope, Cardinals, bishops, priests, and religious were within the colonnade in St. Peter's Square. They're barefoot and crying and dried their tears with a white handkerchief in the right hands while they had ashes in their left hands. I asked, why, Lord, why all this? And I heard the voice of the Virgin cry out, mourning, great mourning, pray for help from heaven, do penance, pray, penance. Then she repeated three times, pray, 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 penance, penance, penance. They cry because they can no longer hold back the evil that rages in the hearts of the men in the world. Men must return to the true God. And she said, to the holy God, do not debate which God. Then I heard a different voice, a stronger voice cry out saying, I am. Then the virgin began to speak again. Man must humble himself and obey God's law and not look for another law that moves him away from God. Then the different voice, the stronger voice cried out, my church is one and you have made it many. My church is holy and you have made it unholy. My church is Catholic, is for all men of goodwill who accept and live the sacraments. My church is apostolic, teach the way of truth, and you will have and you will give life and peace to the world. Pray, humble yourselves, do penance, and you will have peace. That vision came back time and again. March 6, 1996, Bruno, terrible night full of fear, macabre dreams, the dead, blood, blood, blood everywhere, Blood from Piazza Venezia and in the world, blood at St. Peter's. October 15th, 1997. Bruno, today I've relived the dream in which the Virgin brings me to Piazza Venezia, and from there I saw all the terrestrial world drenched with blood. Then she brought me with the atheist crowd to St. Peter's, and there in the square were the Pope, Cardinals, Bishops, and Priests, religious, and relig men and women with handkerchiefs in one hand and ashes in the other, ashes on their heads and wiping their tears with the handkerchiefs. How many sufferings? There are similar visions. February 10th, 2000. Bruno, I'm with all the faithful in St. Peter's to gain Jubilee indulgences. We suddenly hear a booming of a great explosion, then screams death to the Christians. A crowd of barbarians ran into the basilica, killing anyone they met. March 27th, 1977. Bruno, deaths, imprisonments, beatings, and sorrows. So many deaths, so much blood in the street, all against Christians who believe in and love the Eucharist, the Immaculate Virgin, and the Pope. Those who did not deny these three realities were taken, tormented, and killed. He has visions of a pope in distress. January 21st, 1975. 
Bruno, I am always dreaming of the fleeing pulp. Everything explodes, blood, much blood. Many are attacked. Many priests and sisters are dismembered in St. Peter's Square. Wounded. January 19th, 1982. Bruno, last night I dreamt again. I'm in St. Peter's right in front of the basilica waiting for the pulp. The people around were shouting, here he is, here he is. A cry, the pulp is on the ground, stained with blood. March 1st, 1983. Bruno, what you've shown me, Lord, so much blood on the pulp's white cassock. Do not allow it to happen. And killed. February 7th, 1986. Bruno, while the Pope was celebrating Mass, there was a great confusion, and voices rose threatening. They advanced towards the altar. The police began shooting. There are shouts, flee, flee, the Pope is hit. Blood reddens the white cassock, and shouts are heard, he is dead, he is dead. There should then be great tribulation, such as has not been seen from the beginning of the world till now, neither shall be. April 12, 1947, the Virgin. The time has now passed to the end of all things the world. April 12th, the Virgin. Hard times are prepared for you, and before Russia converts and leaves the way of atheism, a tremendous and severe persecution will arise. August 26th, 1999, Bruno. Lord, why do I so often have dreams so ugly as to frighten me? Earthquakes, tsunamis, hordes of assaults against peaceful Christians, rapes, blasphemies, and sins of all sorts. May 12th, 1967, Bruno. The vision of today was terrible. I saw many people fall into a pool of blood, crying for help. And the people passing by laughed without regard to those in the road who were being massacred. A voice shut up, Behold, misery is on the earth. Death will make many shed their own blood. Repent and pray you are helped by God's mighty hand. July 17, 1992. Bruno. What tragedy will there be on this earth? This night I saw men and women pouncing on each other and blood flowing on the ground like water. April 25, 1984. Bruno. This night I have lived the last days of the world. The deluge. Sodom and Gomorrah put together, united with the last days of Pompeii, are nothing compared to what I have seen. January 1st, 1988. Our Lord, you have examples, Sodom and Gomorrah. They did not repent, they did not do penance, they did not pray. And you know what justice has done to them. And other examples like Nineveh, who listened, repented, prayed, and did penance, and they were saved, as you proclaim the prophecies that you do not remember anymore and you have forgotten through your own fault. Well, I still announce to you that if you do not convert, fire and the sword will descend upon you, and by your own fault, on all, small or great, sinful or innocent, good or bad. That's why we call you all to conversion, true peace and true love. What you call peace and all that you're doing for peace is nothing but deceit, because there is no conversion, there is no prayer to the one and holy God, there is no penance for purification for the forgiveness of your sins. All this is preparing for a satanic war, and you will lose your souls. Know this, that Satan, the evil one, the ancient serpent, is thirsty for souls. He wants souls in hell, the punishment deserved for his own will. I call you, convert, sons, and I call you sons of mercy if you convert. Sons of resurrection if you change your life by renewing your heart. Repent and love. This is the sound of the trumpets of the final battle. Love, peace, mercy. The sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven be moved. August 15, 1958, the Virgin. Yes, my children, the sun will darken, the stars will fall, but not here only the material meaning, there's also a spiritual meaning, and it will be the suns, the proud, and the stars, the arrogant, that will fall as Satan has already fallen. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and they shall put you to death, and you shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. April 12, 1947, the Virgin. Priests will be trampled and slaughtered. Satan's wrath is no longer held back. The darkening of conscience and evil that will increase will testify to you of the, of the coming of the final catastrophe. Anger will be unleashed over the earth. Satanic freedom, which will be allowed, will bring massacres everywhere. You will see men driven by Satan make a united league to fight every form of religion. The most stricken will be the Church of Christ to cleanse it of the filth that is in it. December 16, 1995, Bruno. Something serious is being prepared against those who follow Christ. Besides a Holocaust, they will be crushed and banished through the fault of those who have eyes and do not see, ears do not hear, mouths do not speak, and leave the evil ones to do evil. April 12, 1947, the Virgin. From the east, a strong people, but far away from God, will unleash a tremendous attack and will break the most holy and sacred things when it will be allowed them to do so. July 21st, 1998, Bruno. I dreamt that Muslims surrounded the churches and closed the doors with believers inside in prayer, were throwing gas and starting fires from the roofs. 
January 1, 1999. Bruno, a punishment will suddenly come from the East. They will receive the power to be able to subjugate those whom they call infidels. This will happen very soon. And many false prophets shall rise and shall seduce many. April 12, 1947, the Virgin. The entire church will undergo a terrible test to clean up the carnage that is infiltrated among its ministers. Moral testing, spiritual testing. The force of evil will endanger priests and faithful by assaulting them with whatever means they can, especially false ideologies and theologies. April 12, 1947, the Virgin. Prepare your hearts. Draw close with more fervor to the living sacrament among you, the Eucharist, which will be desecrated and no longer believed to be the real presence of my son. February 2nd, 1960, the Virgin. This is the time of mercy, and many things are coming true. Blood and tears, blood of Christ, your mother's tears, the exact sense of the truth is lost, is no longer understood. December 31st, 1990, the Virgin. False prophets seek with all means to poison souls, changing the doctrine of Jesus, my beloved son, into satanic doctrines. And they will remove the sacrifice of the cross that is repeating on the altars of the world. These poisoners will take away the means of salvation, and they've already penetrated into the light of the church. August 14, 1999, the Virgin. Hell exists. It is a place of condemnation for those who live the madness that there is no eternity. Do not deny the evidence. September 21, 1988, Bruno. What I have dreamed will never happen. It is too painful, and I hope the Lord will not allow the Pope to deny all the truths of the faith to put himself in place of God. How much pain I felt in the night. My legs became paralyzed and I could no longer move for the pain which I felt when I saw the church reduced to a mass of ruins. And then shall many be scandalized, shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. April 12, 1947, the Virgin. Hard-hearted shepherds of the flock who do not do their duty give scandal to the flock and divert it from the way, the truth, and life because too much of the world has come into their soul. January 1st, 1999, the Virgin. You prepare souls for perdition and not for salvation because you do not propagate the truth, but false, heretical, and idolatrous doctrines denying the true faith while defending false beliefs that lead to perdition. August 14th, 1999, the Virgin to priests. Do not reject the ancient holy things and do not provoke schisms, but work and pray for unity and not for union. Remember, my children, that loving everyone is not doing what others do who live in error, idolatry, and heresy. These things are to be rejected so as not to fall under the judgment of God. Many have lost this concept of truth and do not realize that they walk and cause you to walk on the false way, far from the substantial ideas of doctrine. January 9, 1986, the Virgin. Satan cannot do anything against the church because it is divine, but he can do a lot against the souls in it. He will introduce evil under the guise of morality, under religious guises, under political and social guises. Families will be affected, especially by dragging them into indifferentism and unbelief or to an exaggerated form of devotional piety bordering on idolatry. This is the evil at times when you live, my beloved children. Every form of evil is gathered together in this time. You have the terrible responsibility to choose either God or the world with all its deceits. January 9th, 1986, the Virgin. For the sake of mercy, I call you all to conversion. But for the sake of justice, I have to let go of my son's hand precisely because justice has to be fulfilled. March 13, 2000, the Virgin. My children, salvation is not bringing together all religions to make of them a cluster of heresies and mistakes, but to convert them to the unity of love and faith. Because iniquity has abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. The Virgin. The broken cross near the cassock signify the stripping of the exterior signs of the priesthood. This will be the sign that charity has grown cold. November 12, 1986, the Virgin. This I say to my priest children, by living as priests or religious, you've forsaken the world while still living in the world. You've renounced the comfortable and wealthy life. You've accepted a life of renunciation and sacrifices. You have promised to live the counsel of Jesus, and he was the first to give you a good example of how to live them. So you must live them as my son in the perfection of the Father's will and religious virtue with the help of charity. You, my fathers, have accepted one the cassock and the religious habit to separate you from the world. Yet you make yourself distracted by so many vain, useless, and futile things, thinking very little about living the exercise of the life of perfection, that primitive religious perfection so needed to cooperate with Jesus for the salvation of those souls waiting for light and salt from you, the consecrated ones. August 14, 1999, the Virgin. 
Many of my sons, priests, have lost the dignity of the priestly order, no longer live in honesty and love, no longer catechize souls. My dear children, understand that a man has a soul to save and the soul will continue to live eternally. Do not forget the last things and teach them to others. What is death? What is judgment? What is hell? What is heaven? What is eternity? The word, my son, who is the way, the truth, and life, has made this known to you. But many of you, through philosophy or false science, deny the truth, do not make it known to souls thirsting for truth. You have this responsibility, my sons. January 4th, 1992, Bruno. Lord, you once showed me in the early days of the graces received a line of priests who entered a church and came out in civilian dress. Now you saw them to be in a cassock, but they're one against other, Christians fighting because they no longer have a leader to guide them. I take that to be the traditionalists in disarray, wearing cassocks, but with no charity. January 1st, 1999, the version of priests. My children, I repeat again, wear the cassock and the habit that sets you apart in your consecration, acceptance of a life given completely to my son. March 11th, 1970. Bruno, what a bad night I passed. The Pope surrounded by cardinals and bishops who shouted at him by saying revolutionary words. We do not want to live an imposed life, but to be free and to practice religion according to our own desires and local system. The Pope shouted crying, no, it is not possible to replace the worship of Christ with pagan cults. The church has fought, fought so much to break down atheism and idolatry. The Pope is caught and hurled into a well. August 30th, 1993, Bruno. I dreamt that a squad of delinquents wanted to attack St. Peter's with loads of dynamite. I begged them not to, but they took me and tied me over a mine, and I should have blown up with it. I prayed, I begged, nothing. I'm freed by the Virgin. I go to tell the Pope. I go to the Pope to tell him the danger that's going on. Everyone laughs. In the room, there were cardinals. August 1st, 1966, Bruno. I find myself in the piazza in front of the church called the Scala Sancta. It was set up as a hall, and bishops, cardinals, personalities of each branch and category are pre present. Suddenly, the whole facade of the church collapses over many bishops, cardinals, and others. August 28, 1986. Bruno is St. Peter's Square with the Virgin who shows him. Those who obey the voice of God in Jesus Christ, the Pope, surrounded in glory, singing praises. Those who do not obey were sunk in gloomy and sorrowful darkness. See, my son, the Virgin tells me, even if those who give an order that you seem to be mistaken to you, you're obliged to obey unless this order touches on faith, morality, or charity. Then no. November 12, 1986, Bruno. She takes me to a big square and says, look what they do to my children, those who remain faithful to the faith in the church of my son and the great persecution for a true purification. I see many priests in their cassocks, religious men and women in religious habits of all shapes and colors, all in a row, and the guards push them and drag them one at a time onto a wooden stage. They make them kneel and ask them, get rid of the habit. To the answer, no, they took his head and put it on a stump they were beheaded by the executioner who had an ax. The blood spurted everywhere, and those who had waited for the same martyrdom cried out, these are the souls who cry out under the altar of God. The assassins and those who witnessed this slaughter shouted, hurrah for atheism. We finally freed ourselves from the habits and the vows that kept us slaves, believing in the existence of God. And here we're finally free. January 1st, 1990, the Virgin. Men of God, those who are called to save men, will encounter obstacles in fulfilling their proper duty, they will not speak of God, of Jesus Christ, nor the Holy Spirit. They will not even be able to speak of me, who is the true mother of God, true bride of God, true daughter of God. They will be prevented, and they will not be able to speak of sacraments or of sacramentals. Those who will speak of these things will be martyred morally and physically, and will become true confessors of Jesus Christ. But he that shall persevere to the end, he shall be saved. April 12, 1947, the Virgin. Come to the heart of Jesus. Come to the heart of a mother and you will be consoled, and you will be unburdened of your sorrows. All sinners come. Consecrate yourself to the Immaculate Heart of a Mother, without doubting that you will be helped. Who can lament of being banished from me if he has consecrated himself to my heart? Who has ever sought help and not been helped? Children, be strong, resist the infernal assault, do not be afraid. I will be with you, with my motherly heart, to give courage to yours and soothe your sorrows. With Christ as leader, I will fight for you. Ask to be saints and do good, and to sanctify yourselves. Distance yourself from the world while living in the world. Faith and charity will remain intact if you're attentive to what I tell you. These are moments of trial for all of you. The Holy Spirit will descend upon you to strengthen you, if you ask him, with faith, to prepare yourself and fortify yourself in the days of God's great battle. Preserve the vic weapon of victory, faith. Love one another. Love one another with humility in your hearts. Love one another with, and greet each other with greetings of love and unity. It is love that wins everything. Do not forget the rosary. 
The Hail Marys, which you say with faith and love, are so many golden arrows to reach the heart of Jesus. Never be tired of being close to the heart of the Eucharistic Jesus. Line up under the standard of Christ. Fortify yourselves, preparing for the battle of the faith. Do not be lazy in the things of God. There's a lot to meditate on there. It's easy to see why Cardinal Martin said he personally considered the publication of these messages to be of great spiritual benefit, why they have an undeniable catechetical and prophetic value. There's a lot to meditate on there. Let's talk briefly about the miracles. As we said yesterday, the number of miracles, uh, or the number of people who pray at the grotto and make pilgrimages there is steadily increasing. In Lourdes, Our Lady works miracles with the water in Rome with the soil. The, the, so the dirt from a, what was once a place of immorality and sin has become a source of grace. I've been there three times. There's so many ex votos that people left in thanksgiving for favors received, conversions, for healings, and ex votos like crutches, braces, so forth, pictures, testimonies. There's so many, they've literally dug a semi-circular tunnel through the hill behind the cave in order to have some place to put them all. I haven't been to every place in Rome, but I've been around there. And there's more ex votos there than any place I've seen. So before we close, we'll briefly consider three miracles. A medical miracle. One of the earliest miracles was the case of Carlo Mancuso. He was a 36-year-old father that fell down an elevator shaft. He shattered his uh, right hand and his pelvic bones. His screams of pain were so terrible that it shook up the entire neighborhood. Someone sprinkled dirt from the cave over his body, and instantly he began to walk. He got up, he began to walk, and he didn't have any pain. Now what was even more amazing is the x-rays showed his bones were still broken. They hadn't healed. And not only did he have no pain, he had full movement and use of his limbs. That's just one of many cases that can't be explained in light of science. So that's one medical miracle. A moral, a moral miracle. Of course, in and of themselves, moral, moral miracles are far greater than medical miracles. In a certain sense, they're infinitely greater. Because on the one hand, on a medical miracle, we're talking about the order of nature. But with moral miracles, we're talking about the order of grace. Obviously, Bruno's uh, conversion is a moral miracle. One of the Carmelite monks uh, told me a story a few years ago. His brother-in-law was teaching in New York City, and some years ago, he brought a group of his students to Rome. They visited the Grotta Tre Fontane, and one of his students, when they walked in, instantly converted, just like that. Now, what makes this particular conversion even more mo moving is that when that student walked into the grotto, he was a Satanist. Why is Our Lady doing so many miracles? To confirm the truth of her message that she really did appear there to Luigi and Bruno, let us know that in spite of the fact that her messages are very challenging, in spite of all the chaos, sin, and disorder in the church and the world, that she hasn't forgot us, that she loves us, she really loves us, and her messages are messages of love and truth from her immaculate heart because she loves us. One last miracle and we'll close. In November of 1979, the Virgin told Bruno that on the 33rd anniversary of her first apparition, on April 12, 1980, she promised to make a great sign in the sun to bring unbelievers to faith. She told him not to say anything. His confessor told Bruno to write it all down, show it to particular mother superior as a witness to the prophecy of the upcoming miracle. He did so. Then in a talk on that first Friday of April, he mentioned to the members of his catechetical group that Our Lady had promised spiritual material graces for April 12th. On April 12th, there were more than 3,000 people, including 25 priests, gathered at the grotto to hear Bruno speak and attend a commemorative mass. Now, to picture this, the altar is up at the, at the, the cave. If this is the altar, the cave is behind it with a statue, and there's like a little sort of a, the, the chapel, it's open on that end. So it's an arch over it, but it's just open to the open air. And so if you had any crowd at all, most people outside, with 3,000 people, most of them are going to be just sitting out there on this plaza that they can look in into, at the altar, but it's just there to cover. There's not much protection from the winter there. Okay, so the Mass began about uh, 5 p.m. and about 10 to 6. It was interrupted for half an hour until 6.20 because of the miracle. And this was not an abuse. They just had 3,000 3, very excited Italians, so they had to halt the Mass so the people could actually calm down and return their attention to the Holy Sacrifice. I will quote from two reports, one ecclesiastical and the other secular. Quote, the official report sent by the Franciscan Alfonso Zincarini to the Minister General of the Order, Father Vitalia Bormalco, contains a summary of the written testimonies gathered in the days following the miracle. The sun seemed to move through the sky towards the grotto and approach the earth. It could be seen with absolute ease, without hurting the eyes, as a ball of fire rotating wildly. Seeming larger than normal, there appeared inside its iridescent crown in various, various colors, mainly red, pink, and black, like incandescent magma moving rapidly as if boiling, forming different configurations. 
variously identified by the witnesses, a cross, an M, a heart surrounded by stars of dripping blood, the monogram of Christ, the IHS, two joined hands, uh, the Virgin of Revelation. Some declared they saw the solar crown dissolved and reconnected in three circles of various colors. Others have noted that despite the obstacle of numerous trees, the sound bounced around in clear sight with a warm and vivid light, almost like fire. It illuminated the chapel of the convent where the Eucharist is kept, the fronds of the trees, and the clothing of the people. The notebooks were the accounts of those who were present, and among them, many children, together with numerous religious, civil, and military authorities, are kept in both the archives of the Franciscans as well as the archives of the Catechetical Association founded by Bruno. There have been the same testimonies of always about the 12th of April, in particular 1982, 1985, 1986, and 1987 on the 40th anniversary." Close quote. Now many lapsed Catholics returned to the faith. There were many physical cures. A medical center was uh, set up and after extensive research, the uh, miraculous nature of those cures was confirmed. In 1986, the miracle of the sun was recorded by a TV camera was shown on Italian TV. I'll uh, take a selection of quotes from a translation of an article from Il Tempo, a large daily newspaper in Rome. 18 April 1986, quote, on the 12th of April last, at the sanctuary of the Three Fountains in the Via Laurentina, the sun pulsated for a considerable time like a heart subject to violent emotion. At the same time, other incredible changes were observed on the sun's surface, all of them faithfully filmed by a cameraman who happened to be on the spot at the time. As though in a surrealistic vision, the sun at one moment turned bright red and another emerald green. Its colors glowed and gigantic shafts of light shone down from the sky under the thousands of witnesses who flocked to the hill. The crowd at Tre Fontani included both highly placed ecclesiastics and personalities from the worlds of politics and arts. Starting from the 33rd anniversary of her apparition, there were to be, precisely as the Virgin of Revelation had prophesied, many manifestations and graces, both inward and external. We have to admit that this promise, great and binding as it was, was very precisely carried out. The whole phenomenon has been filled by a TV camera, even if, and it is important to remember this, the attitude of the church remains marked by the utmost reticence. Close quote, article from Il Temple. So obviously, besides confirming that she really did uh, appear to Luigi and Bruno, besides confirming these challenging messages are really are from her, besides confirming she hasn't forgotten us, that she loves us, she really loves us, besides confirming her message, her message of truth and love for Immaculate Heart, by working this spectacular miracle so many times, the Virgin of Revelation gave us another very important and perfectly obvious message. Small wonder that as early as June 1948, Bruno recorded his diary. The Virgin made me understand that the message of Fatima continues at Trey Fontaine. <laughs>